Welcome to the Wild Wisdom Podcast with Dr. Patricia Mills. I'm Dr. Patricia. This podcast is for people who want to transform their health, restore their hormones, and reconnect to their body's natural wisdom. Hi, I'm Dr. Patricia. I'm a Canadian medical doctor, published author, internationally recognized researcher, and passionate advocate for your health. Here, we'll explore the intersection between ancient wisdom and cutting-edge science, distilling the essence of true health into practical steps you can take. Wild wisdom is instinctive knowledge in action. Thanks for making this part of your day. Hello, and welcome to the Wild Wisdom Podcast. This segment has been taken from Thrive Thursdays with Dr. Patricia Mills. I hope you enjoy this episode, and here is Dr. Patricia Mills. And uh, while we get started, I'm Dr. Patricia Mills. I'm a medical doctor. I specialize in physical medicine rehabilitation. I'm also a functional medicine practitioner, which means that we get to root causes of disease and fix the root cause versus um, stopping at Band-Aid solutions like medications, which are sometimes necessary. However, I consider them to be a bridge to get you to where you want to go and not the destination itself. Uh, And uh, today I'm really excited to talk to you about Um, how your thoughts control your DNA, and the fact that this actually has been shown through um, hard cutting, uh, like cutting edge uh, science, which is really, really cool. Um, And there's actually two things I have to teach you about to uh, convince you, so to speak, that you can control your DNA with your thoughts. So the first thing I need to teach you about that has just been coming out in 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 the research Actually, it has been discovered since 1960s by Dr. Bruce Lipton, PhD doctor who is researching DNA in the cells at the cellular level. And, uh, but it's just taken a long time for this to start percolating out into um, the general population, and it certainly has not reached mainstream medicine as far as I am aware of. So this is really cool stuff. So the first piece of information I'm going to teach you about how your thoughts control your DNA is the fact that your DNA um, is not um, determining how your body is being built and how your health is. So, you know, we used to think the old paradigm, which is still the mainstream medicine, is that your DNA is like um, um, the blueprint of your body and it dictates how your body is built and it um, provides the instructions to the body as to what to do um, to build itself. And so it determines your health. And um, uh, the problem with this theory is that, and it's not fact, actually, it's been disproven, but the problem with this theory when it was being um, taught is that it promoted a sense of um, disempowerment. Like, okay, so I'm um, basically, um, like I'm a, a victim of my DNA. So what I got from my mom and from my dad is uh, determining basically um, my health. And so if I have a family history of like cancer or high cholesterol uh, or diabetes and that kind of thing, well, that's just my DNA playing itself out and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, that is far from the truth. What we know now is that the DNA is more like a, um, let's say a piano, okay? So it's a piano and you have like, you know, in a piano, you have your piano keys. So you've got your, you, when you're born with a certain kind of piano. And just like with the piano, you can play uh, a variety of music with the same, um, you know, scales. Let's say you, you're born with like, you know, eight scales and you can play the full, you can use all the full range of those scales and you have your um, um, and you have like, what you can do is you play the music and the music is the expression of the DNA. And that's how your that's is expressed in your body and in your health. Well, the interesting thing is that with the same DNA, depending on how that DNA is used by the body, you can get different expressions of body and health being created. Okay. So what does that mean on a practical level? So, okay. Your DNA is sitting inside your cell. It's specifically in the nucleus of your cell, okay? And it's just sitting there. It's like this, like, it's like a piano. It's just sitting there. It is not playing itself. The DNA does not play itself. The DNA just sits there. And it's like a piano just waiting to be played. And what plays the piano, so to speak? What plays the DNA? What decides what the DNA is, what part of the DNA is turned on and what part of the DNA is turned off? Okay, 
And when I mean like turned on and off, look, for example, cancer, let's use cancer as an example or Alzheimer's as an example, right? We know that there are certain genes that increase the risk of developing cancer, increase the risk of developing uh, Alzheimer's, but these are not 100%, as in it, it's very rare. There's only 2% of diseases where it's like you have the you have the gene, you get the condition, like Huntington's Korea, you know, it's like you have it, you get it. Everything else is that it loads the gun, but something pulls the trigger. So having the, the gene, like the DNA, puts you at a much higher risk, but there still is something else that's going to actually turn that gene on or off that would create the cancer, create the Alzheimer's. What is that thing? It's the environment. It's the, the molecules, the chemistry around the DNA. So, for example, what turns a part of the DNA on or off? So, like, let's say the DNA is a piano and you have, like, eight scales. Well, like, the body, some things can happen to the body where, like, one of those scales get turned off. Like, you cannot play with that anymore. That changes what you, that piano is capable of. That changes what that DNA is capable of, right? It limits the expression of that DNA. And that's when you start getting into health issues, right? So instead of having the full DNA available to create full abundant health, now you're limiting um, your body's ability, like what your body can use from the DNA. So what turns the DNA on is called uh, molecules that, uh, it's the chemistry that adds molecules like methyl molecules to the DNA. It's like a switch on, okay? And when you remove the methyl, it's like a switch off. And there's other things like, Basically, the environment is, is like a, a chemical soup. So the DNA is sitting there in the nucleus and things get into the nucleus from the inside of the, of the cell. And how are things getting into the cell? They're getting from the outside of the cell through your blood, right? So for example, your blood is sending all of these chemical messengers through the body. Those messengers, hormones, right? Hormones go into the cell and they initiate a cascade of reactions that then go into the nucleus and turn the DNA on and off, okay? So now what you're seeing now is that it's actually the environment around the cell that influences how the DNA is um, used, okay? All right, now let's talk about how do we control the environment? Well, where do those hormones come from? A lot of those hormones, first of all, hormones can come from any organ, organ in the body. Every cell is capable of making hormones, but the master hormone controller is the brain, right? The brain is what sends the signals, a lot of the signals that activate the thyroid, the ovaries, um, the adrenal glands to make hormones. And then those hormones get distributed through the body and they go into each cell and then they, they cause this chemical reaction within the cell that then goes into the nucleus and turns the DNA on and off. Okay, are you with me? Is this making sense so far? Please say, I'm seeing hearts. I love it. Thank you so much. It lets me know I'm on track here. Perfect. Um, what you need to understand is like, okay, so if the brain, um, so there, this is part of the picture, right? So part of the picture is that the brain is creating these like uh, hormone signaling so what creates the hormone signaling? Well, a lot of our hormone signaling comes from um, our thoughts resulting in emotions. So emotions are energy in motion. So let me give you an example here. Let's get really specific. Let's say you close your eyes and then you open up your eyes and in front of you, you see someone that you perceive as being someone that you love. Let's say it's your partner, right? And so you open the eyes, you, you see someone that you perceive as being a loving character in your life. What that does is it activates the emotion of love in your brain. So certain neural networks in your brain get activated. That initiates a cascade of, uh, so the neural networks get activated and signals get sent down, for example, to your pituitary, which releases the, the hormone of love, which is oxytocin, right? Oxytocin. Um, which is also released in bonding with your baby and all the, and like that feel good, unconditional love, like that, you know, that like really deep peace feeling you get from knowing you're in real health, like that's oxytocin mediated, right? So oxytocin gets released through the blood into the bloodstream. It travels through the blood. It goes into the cells and it creates a chemical reaction within the cells. And the is, result is that the DNA is turned on at the right places and off at the places you don't want, like certain parts of the DNA, like for example, that gene that predisposes you to cancer, Alzheimer's, 
that gets turned off or turned down. Like the, 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 that it's like a volume button. It gets turned down or off. That's the effect of the hormone of oxytocin. Okay. Now let's say that you've had an argument with your partner or things are not going well. So you close your eyes, you open up your eyes, you see your partner, but now you perceive that as a stressful thing. You're seeing your partner and you're stressed out. Well, then the brain then sets up the uh, activates the neural networks of like fear or anger or guilt or shame or whatever that might be, right? And it initiates an, another neural network cascade of events. And the hormone that gets triggered with that from your brain is cortisol. So it sends a message down to your adrenal glands. The hormone cortisol gets gets sent out. And what we know about the hormone cortisol is that it um, is in, in small amounts, like in the morning time when you wake up, it's necessary and extremely healthful. But when it gets released throughout the day in large amounts, it is extremely damaging to your DNA. It, it, and it's extremely damaging to organ body parts, but basically it flushes through the system, it percolates into the cells, it initiates chemical cascades within the cells that go into the DNA and actually hurt your DNA. It turns off the good genes, it turns on the bad genes, it has a number of other effects, but at the genetic level, it is playing the genes like a piano. So the music that you get from your piano with oxytocin is health and happiness and um, a vibrancy and energy and aliveness and just unconditional love, right? That feeling of like abundance and the the piano, the DNA is being played by the hormone cortisol is like disease, fear, inflammation. That's what inflammation does at a cellular DNA level. Um, and that's what cortisol does at a cellular DNA level is it starts to initiate the DNA expression, expression of music. They call it DNA expression. You can think of it as expressing itself in a poor health. So um, that's the power of thought. And that has been absolutely proven there. And do you want to know how I know this 100 percent? And in fact, every single doctor, if they uh, if they heard this and I and share this, if you want, with your doctors. But if they heard this, this is the proof. I'm a researcher as well, by the way, I'm, I'm published. Um, I have over 25 publications in the medical literature. You can search me. It's Patricia Mills or Patricia Branco Mills through PubMed, which is like the oracle of research. Um, so I know this very well. When we do clinical studies, we have to do a certain kind of uh, clinical study for um, testing drugs because, and it's called the randomized control trial. Okay, bear with me. This may seem very weird, but it actually has a very, very important point. So um, what they do, what the researchers have to do is they have to take um, a group of people, and let's say they want to study um, uh, uh, a med medication for cancer, or Alzheimer's, and insert any disease, type 2 diabetes, whatever you want, right? Uh, ALS, MS, okay? And you have this drug you want to study to see, does it help the condition improve? Can it heal the person or not, right? So they take the group of people and they have to randomly divide them into two groups and then give one group the drug and give the other group the uh, uh, placebo, which is but placebo is like, it looks like the drug, it tastes like the drug, it behaves like the drug. If it's surgery, you, you do everything related to it to make it look like it's real surgery, but it's not the real thing. But you don't tell that group, you, you say, you are getting the real thing, okay? Or you don't know if you are getting the real thing or not. So these people in the two groups, they don't know if they're getting the real thing, but they have a perception as to whether or not they are. And then they do the study, and then they, and they look at the results, they compare this group to that group. Why do they have to do this kind of study? Because before they used to do this kind of study, what they found was that people, 30% um, or more of the people in these groups that received the placebo, that received the non-actual drug, got better. They healed themselves. They took the, the pill that was like a sugar pill and not the drug pill, and their problem went away. That in, in non-medical terms, that's called healing. In the research, it's called the placebo effect. I'm getting goosebumps just talking about this, ladies. I hope you understand where I'm going with this. So if it wasn't the drug that healed them, what made their condition get better or go away? It was the belief, the belief that they were being given something that would make them get better. It was the power of their thoughts. It was so powerful that it activated neural networks within their brain that resulted in a chemical cascade going through their body and all of those molecules of emotion that were traveling through their bloodstream 
started going through and it started impacting their DNA and other organ functions to the point where that condition went away. And that happens in cancer, that happens in, in um, MS, that happens in like amazing, like it's, it's diabetes, like it happens in every single, every single, every single condition. It's called the placebo effect. If you don't believe me, Google it, the placebo effect. And here's the other thing, you know what's the opposite of the placebo effect? It's called the nocebo effect. Nocebo effect. And it's actually from noxious, as in bad. We, we actually can, uh, there were people who um, took the sugar pill, for example, and they, they made themselves sick. They, they said, oh, I took, I, I, you gave me the drug because I'm getting a really bad side effect. And then the, the investigators go and they um, unblind. Like the investigators can't know what they're taking either. That's a double blind. The people don't know and the investigators don't know. That's a double blind randomized control trial. So then the, the um, investigators go in and say, oh, actually, you were on the sugar pill. There's no way you're getting a side effect from the drug because you actually didn't get the drug. And the person's like, oh, I know this for a fact. I was doing a study, um, sorry, not myself, but my colleague was doing a study on Botox, botulinum toxin injecting the medication into the neck to see if it would help um, certain conditions that develop around the neck and shoulders and to try and relax the muscles with Botox. There was a, um, a participant in the study who um, developed weakness, which is a potential problem of injecting Botox, like weakness, problems swallowing, choking, problems with breathing. And he was like, I got an issue, like I have this problem with this um, um, medication. And they looked and they said, you did, actually didn't get the medication. You got the needle in, but there was nothing injected. He psychologically, his, the power of his brain was such, he was able to activate the power of his brain so strongly in the negative way that he made himself ill. So I want you to think to yourself, first of all, where in my life, where in my life am I potentially making myself sick or missing out on the opportunity to make myself healthy with the power of my thoughts? with the belief, with the power of my belief, right? And remember when I said, you close your eyes, you see your partner, you know, you open your eyes, you see your partner. Do you notice I said the word perception? You perceive that this person is good in your life? You perceive that this person is bad in your life? Well, the reality is that cortisol hormone, which is damaging, is released in uh, response not to the actual stress itself, but to your perception of the stress. I think we can all understand that you can have two situations in life, right? Uh, the same situation in life, two different people perceiving the same situ situation in life, and they both have two completely different perceptions of that situation, right? So, for example, like um, your, um, your uh, dishwasher breaks, right? And one person's like, oh, my God, the dishwasher breaks. Oh, you know, stress. I have to call this. I have to do that. The other person's like, okay, well, my dishwasher broke. Well, I mean, it was time to get a dishwasher. You know, it's kind of a nice opportunity for me to get a new one. The same event, it's the same reality, right? The same reality, but a different perception of that reality. So here's another thought for you. Where in your life can you alter your perception so that when a certain trigger, a, a, a reality is experienced by yourself, you can consciously choose to perceive it in a positive way. And that is the deep practice of gratitude, okay? So, for example, I just posted this on my Instagram. I have Instagram uh, at dr.patriciamills, dr.patriciamills, dr.patriciamills. And this is what I posted. I said, today I am deeply grateful for the fact that my dad was diagnosed with ALS amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, a, a fatal disease with no cure. And I can see the gratitude in that because it forced me out of my state of complacency in Western medicine, where I thought I knew everything and I had a, and I had a closed mind to new information or different ways of thinking of things. I was resting in my comfort zone. And when my dad got this diagnosis, which he ultim ultimately passed away from, I was catapulted out of my comfort zone into a zone of, of like, okay, I have got to figure this out. And Western medicine doesn't have the tools to figure this out. But I know that there's something that can be done because we had no family history of ALS. There was absolutely nothing that was um, genetic. It was, it's called idiopathic, like there's no family history. But even if there was, there is always something that can be done to change the way that your body is using its DNA 
so that you can have a different expression of health. So going from ALS to no ALS, I just, I just knew this deep down inside. So I put on my researcher hat, I started diving into the research and I, and I found, I found the threads of truth of the essence of true health. I found functional medicine. I now know um, if I could go back in time, I know I could help my dad reverse this condition uh, given the opportunity. And I'm so grateful for him and his experience. And I know it was the hardest thing that we ever went through as a family, but it brought us closer together. So I can, I can change my perception of that event. I could either have post-traumatic stress disorder from how horrible that was. It was, it was very difficult. And I can also choose to see the grace in that moment, the grace in that experience, the gratitude that the universe brought me exactly what I needed to become the person I am now sitting here in front of you presenting with this information. Where in your life can you see this opportunity to change your belief so you can change your biology, uh, biology so you can bathe your cells in the feel-good hormones of gratitude and unconditional love and just all of those beautiful positive emotions, trust, faith. Um, I'm not religious, but I'm deeply spiritual, and I'm deeply spiritual, and I believe that these emotions of, of unconditional love, trust, faith, um, surrender, um, joy, ecstasy, abundance, all of those emotions they go and bathe your cells and they change your DNA and it's a good change. And the emotions of fear and concern and worry and shame and guilt and anxiety, those bathe your cells in a toxic chemical soup and they change the way your DNA is used. That is science. That is hard fact. You know, I'm not, this is not woo woo stuff. I can give you the research if you need it. And um, Caroline here is saying Bruce Lipton Biology of Belief book, also great to read about exactly. And I, as I mentioned at the very beginning, Dr. Bruce Lipton discovered he's the father of epigenetics. This is a science. It's called epigenetics. It's the epi is above and around the genes. So as I mentioned in the 1960s, this was Dr. Bruce Lipton who observed that he, he took the same cell, the same, he cloned it. So exact same DNA. He cloned the cells, the exact same DNA put them in different culture mediums. What is culture mediums? It's like the blood. It's like the blood in your tissues. And depending on what he put in the blood surrounding this cell and the blood surrounding this cell, you got two totally different experiences of the cellular evolution. One cell evolved healthy and one cell evolved diseased with the same DNA. This is when he coined the phrase epigenetics. This is what we're talking about. This is not woo-woo. You have the power to alter your DNA. And I'm now uh, making you aware of this power. And what I want you to do as well is uh, when you're done this, go into your life and start to notice where can you start altering your belief? What tools do you have at your disposal to do that? For me, it was meditation, mindfulness, mindset coaching. These are the things that I teach my clients in addition to doing personalized protocols, personalized supplement um, protocols, uh, one-on-one uh, health transformation expert interactions. because. I know that for me to get my clients to the utmost, uh, like the, uh, the biggest, like most maximal health they can possibly achieve, I need them to believe that this is possible, okay? When you believe that you can achieve optimal health and you know that you're doing what you need to do, that's when you start experiencing the biology of belief in a positive way. And what I want you to know is this is my function, is to be the, the health transformation expert that you need in your life to give you that confidence that you are doing exactly what you need to be doing to get the health that you want. You're not chasing rabbit holes and um, confused by what the what you're hearing in mainstream me uh, media and on Instagram and on Facebook and all these things. A lot of, out, uh, of it out there is just not true. It can be extremely damaging to you as a woman. Most of the research is done on men when it comes to optimal protein and fasting and ke ketogenic diets. You need to have a very customized approach unique for your body. If you're looking to work with somebody, I'm available and I'm, I'm desiring a, a, a woman who is um, invested in her health, who is willing to make the changes, who wants that support, okay? So if you're watching this and you love what I have to offer, also go into my Facebook group, Wild Wisdom for Women with Dr. Patricia Mills, MD. I do lives every Wednesday. I post every day. This is where I really is my big service to humanity. 
Um, so I look forward to seeing you there. If you need to connect with me, please direct message me or email me info at drpatriciamills.com. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time. It's your most valuable resource and I so appreciate it. I hope that you uh, can take this and make it immediately applicable into your life because that's what I want. We need more women. We absolutely need more women who are thriving and not surviving. And this is my mission is helping every woman uh, rise. Thank you, ladies. Whenever you catch this, I hope you're having a wonderful day, evening, or night. And I'll catch you next time. Bye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast, Wild Wisdom with Dr. Patricia Mills. If you like this podcast, please take the time to like and subscribe. And please feel free to leave any comments and look below for the contact information if you want to connect with me directly. Thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful day, evening or night. Hi, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only. This podcast is not a substitute for a professional care doctor or other qualified medical professional. This podcast is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you are looking for help in your journey, it is important that you seek out a qualified health practitioner. If you would like to work with Dr. Patricia for her expert health transformation guidance, please email her at info at drpatriciamills.com to book a discovery call. You can also find Dr. Patricia on Instagram at Dr. Patricia Mills and Facebook at Wild Wisdom for Women with Dr. Patricia Mills, MD. For access to all of Dr. Patricia's educational videos and more amazing perks, consider becoming a Patreon member. Links are in the description of this episode. It is important to have an expert in your corner that can help you make the changes you crave, especially when it comes to your health. 